Book Twelve, Part Two of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lipa. The Aeneid by Virgil, translated by John Dryden. Book Twelve, The Fortunes of War, Part Two. As the black swallows near the palace plies, O'er empty courts and under arches flies, Now hawks aloft, now skims along the flood, To furnish her loquacious nest with food, So drives the rapid goddess over the plains. The smoking horses run with loosened reins, She steers a various course among the foes, Now here, now there, her conquering brother shows, Now with a straight now with a wheeling flight she turns and bends but shuns the single fight aeneas fired with fury breaks the crowd and seeks his foe and calls by name aloud he runs within a narrower ring and tries to stop the chariot but the chariot flies if he but gain a glimpse juturna fears and far away the danian hero bears what should he do nor arts nor arms avail, and various cares in vain his mind assail. The great Messapus thundering through the field, in his left hand two pointed javelins held, encountering on the prince one dart he drew, and with unerring aim and utmost vigor threw. Aeneas saw it come, and stooping low, beneath his buckler shunned the threatening blow. The weapon hissed above his head and tore the wavering plume which on his helm he wore. Forced by this hostile act and fired with spite, That flying Turnus still declined the fight. The prince, whose piety had long repelled, His inborn ardor now invades the field, Invokes the powers of violated peace, Their rights and injured altars to redress, Then to his rage abandoning the rein, With blood and slaughtered bodies fills the plain. What God can tell, what numbers can display The various labors of that fatal day? What chiefs and champions fell on either side In combat slain, or by what deaths they died, Whom Turnus, whom the Trojan hero killed, Who shared the fame and fortune of the field? Jove, couldst thou view, and not avert thy sight, Two jarring nations joined in cruel fight? Whom leagues of lasting love so shortly shall unite. Aeneas first Rutulian Sucro found, Whose valor made the Trojans quit the ground. Betwixt his ribs the javelin drove, So just it reached his heart, nor needs a second thrust. Now Turnus at two blows two brethren slew. First from his horse fierce Amicus he threw, Then leaping on the ground on foot assailed Diorus, and in equal fight prevailed, Their lifeless trunks he leaves upon the place, Their heads distilling gore his chariot grace. Three cold on earth the Trojan hero threw, Whom without respite at one charge he threw, Cathegus, Tanias, Tagus fell oppressed, And sad Onithes added to the rest Of Theban blood, whom Peridia bore. Turnus, two brothers from the Lycian shore, and from Apollo's fane to battle sent, overthrew, nor Phoebus could f their fate prevent. Peaceful Menothes, after these he killed, who long had shunned the dangers of the field. On Lerna's lake a silent life he led, and with his nets an angle earned his bread, nor pompous cares nor palaces he knew, but wisely from the infectious world withdrew. Poor was his house, his father's painful hand discharged his rent and ploughed another's land. As flames along the lofty woods are thrown, On different sides and both by winds are blown, The laurels crackle in the sputtering fire, The frightened sylvans from their shades retire, Or as two neighboring torrents fall from the sky, Rapid they run, the foamy waters fry, They roll to the sea with unresisted force, And down the rocks precipitate their course, Not with less rage the Rival heroes take their different ways, nor less destruction make. With spears afar, with swords at hand they strike, And zeal of slaughter fires their souls alike. Like them, their dauntless men maintain the field, And hearts are pierced unknowing how to yield. They blow for blow return, and wound for wound, 
and heaps of bodies raise the level ground. Moranus, boasting of his blood that springs from a long royal race of Latian kings, is by the Trojan from his chariot throne, crushed with the weight of an unwieldy stone. Betwixt the wheels he fell, the wheels that bore his living load his dying body tore. His starting steeds to shun the glittering sword, paw down his trampled limbs, forgetful of their lord. Fierce Hylas threatened high and face to face, affronted Turnus in the middle space. The prince encountered him in full career, and at his temples aimed the deadly spear. So fatally the flying weapon sped, that through his helmet pierced his head. Nor Sisius could escape from Turnus' hand, in vain the strongest of the Arcadian band. Nor to Capentus could his gods afford, availing against the Aeneian sword, which to his naked heart pursued the course, nor could his plated shield sustain the force. Aeolus fell, whom not the Grecian powers, nor great subverter of the Trojan towers, were doomed to kill, while heaven prolonged his date. But who can pass the bounds prefixed by fate? In high Lernesis and in Troy he held two palaces, and was from each expelled, of all the mighty man that last remains, a little spot of foreign earth contains. And now both hosts their broken troops unite in equal ranks and mix in mortal fight. Ceristhus and undaunted Menestus join the Trojan, Tuscan, and Arcadian line. Seaborn Messapus with Atanius heads, the Latin squadrons, and to battle leads. They strike, they push, they throng the scanty space, Resolved on death, impatient of disgrace, And where one falls, another fills his place. The Cyprian goddess now inspires her son To leave the unfinished fight and storm the town, For while he rolls his eyes around the plain In quest of Turnus, whom he seeks in vain, He views the unguarded city from afar, In careless quiet and secure of war. Occasion offers and excites his mind To dare beyond the task he first designed. Resolved, he calls his chiefs, they leave the fight. Attended thus, he takes a neighboring height. The crowding troops about their general stand, All under arms, and wait his high command. Then thus the lofty prince, Hear and obey, ye Trojan bands. Without the least delay, Jove is with us, and what I have decreed requires our utmost vigor and our speed. Your instant arms against the town prepare, the source of mischief and the seat of war. This day the Latian towers that mate the sky shall level with the plain in ashes lie. The people shall be slaves, unless in their time they kneel for pardon and repent their crime. Twice have our foes been vanquished on the plain. Then shall I wait till Turnus will be slain? Your force against the perjured city bend. There it began, and there the war shall end. The peace profaned our rightful arms requires. Cleanse the polluted place with purging fires. He finished, and one soul inspiring all, Formed in a wedge, the foot approached the wall. Without the town, an unprovided train Of gaping, gazing citizens are slain. Some firebrands, other scaling ladders bear. And those they toss aloft, and these they rear. The flames now launch, the feathered arrows fly, And clouds of missive arms obscure the sky. Advancing to the front the hero stands, And stretching out to heaven his pious hands, Attests the gods, asserts his innocence, Upbraids with breach of faith the Ausonian prince, Declares the royal honor doubly stained, And twice the rites of holy peace profaned. Dissenting clamors in the town arise, Each will be heard, and all at once advise. One part for peace, one for war contends, Some would exclude their foes, and some admit their friends. The helpless king is hurried in the throng, And, whatever the tide prevails, is borne along. Thus when the swain within a hollow rock Invades the bees with suffocating smoke, They run around, or labor on their wings, Disused to flight, and shoot, their sleepy stings, to shun the bitter fumes in vain they try. Black vapors issuing from the vent involve the sky. 
But fate and envious fortune now prepare To plunge the Latins in the last despair. The queen, who saw the foes invade the town, And brands on top of burning houses thrown, Cast round her eyes, distracted with her fear. No troops of Turnus in the field appear. Once more she stares abroad, but still in vain, And then concludes the royal youth is slain. Mad with her anguish, impotent to bear the mighty grief, she loathes the vital air. She calls herself the cause of all this ill, and owns the dire effects of her ungoverned will. She raves against the gods, she beats her breast, she tears with both her hands her purple vest. Then round a beam a running noose she tied, and fastened by the neck obscenely died. Soon as the fatal news by fame was blown, and to her dames and to her daughter known the sad lavinia rends her yellow hair and rosy cheeks the rest her sorrows share with shrieks the palace rings and madness of despair the spreading rumor fills the public place confusion fear distraction and disgrace and silent shame are seen in every face latinus tears his garments as he goes both for his public and his private woes with filth his venerable beard besmears and sordid dust deforms his silver hairs and much he blames the softness of his mind obnoxious to the charms of womankind and soon seduced to change what he so well designed to break the solemn league so long desired nor finish what his fates and those of troy required now turnus rolls aloof o'er empty plains and here and there some struggling foes he gleans. His flying coursers please him less and less, ashamed of easy fight and cheap success. Thus half-contented, anxious in his mind, the distant cries come driving in the wind, shouts from the walls, but shouts and murmurs drowned, a jarring mixture and a boding sound. Alas, said he, what mean these dismal cries? What doleful clamors from the town arise? Confused, he stops, and backward pulls the reins. She who the driver's office now sustains replies, Neglect, my lord, these new alarms. Here fight and urge the fortune of your arms. There want not others to defend the wall. If by your rival's hand the Italians fall, So shall your fatal sword his friends oppress, In honor equal, equal in success. To this the prince, O oh, sister, for I knew the peace infringed proceeded first from you. I knew you when you mingled first in fight, and now in vain you would deceive my sight. Why, goddess, this unprofitable care? Who sent you down from heaven, involved in air, your share of mortal sorrows to sustain, and see your brother bleeding on the plain? For to what power can Turnus have recourse, or how resist his fate's prevailing force? These eyes beheld Moranus bite the ground. Mighty the man, and mighty was the wound. I heard my dearest friend with dying breath, my name invoking to revenge his death. Brave Euphans fell, with honor on the place, to shun the shameful sight of my disgrace. On earth supine, a manly corpse, he lies, his vest and armor are the victor's prize. Then shall I see Laurentum in a flame, which only wanted to complete my shame. How will the Latins hoot their champions' flight? How Drances will insult and point them to the sight? Is death so hard to bear, ye gods below? Since those above so small compassion show, Receive a soul unsullied yet with shame, Which not belies my great forefather's name, he said. And while he spoke, with flying speed came sages urging on his foamy steed. Fixed on his wounded face a shaft he bore, and seeking Turnus sent his voice before. Turnus, on you, on you alone, depends our last relief. Compassionate your friends. Like lightning, fierce Aeneas rolling on with arms and vests, with flames invades the town. The brands are tossed on high, the winds conspire to drive along the deluge of the fire. All eyes are fixed on you. Your foes rejoice, even the king staggers and suspends his choice. Doubts to deliver or defend the town, whom to reject or whom to call his son. 
the queen on whom your utmost hopes were placed, herself suborning death, has breathed her last. Tis true, Misappus, fearless of his fate, with fierce Atenus' aid, defends the gate. On every side, surrounded by the foe, the more they kill, the greater numbers grow. An iron harvest mounts, and still remains to mow. You, far aloof from your forsaken bands, your rolling chariot drive over empty. Stupid, he sate, his eyes on death declined, and various cares revolving in his mind, rage boiling from the bottom of his heart, and sorrow mixed with shame his soul oppressed, and conscious worth lay laboring in his thought, and love by jealousy to madness wrought, by slow degrees his reason drove away, the mists of passion, and resumed her sway. Then rising on his car, he turned his look, and saw the town involved in fire and smoke, a wooden tower with flames already blazed, which his own hands on beams and rafters raised, and bridges laid above to join the space, and wheels below to roll from place to place. Sister, the fates have vanquished, let us go, the way which heaven and my hard fortune show. The fight is fixed, nor shall the branded name of a base coward blot your brother's fame. Death is my choice, but suffer me to try my force, and vent my rage before I die, he said, and leaping down without delay, through crowds of scattered foes he freed his way, striding he passed, impetuous as the wind, and left the grieving goddess far behind, as when a fragment from a mountain torn by raging tempests, or by torrents borne, or sapped by time, or loosed from the roots, prone through the void, the rocky ruin shoots, rolling from crag to crag, from steep to steep, down sink at once the shepherds and their sheep, involved alike they rush to nether ground, stunned with the shock they fall, and stunned from earth rebound. So Turnus, hasting headlong into town, shouldering and shoving, bore the squadrons down, still pressing onwards to the wall he drew, where shafts and spears and darts promiscuous flew, and sanguine streams the slippery ground embrew. First stretching out his arm in sign of peace, he cries aloud to make the combat cease. Rutulians hold, and Latin troops retire. The fight is mine, and me the gods require. Tis just that I should vindicate alone the broken truce, or for the breach atone. This day shall free from wars the Ausonian state, or finish my misfortunes in my fate. Both armies from their bloody work desist, and bearing backwards form a spacious list. The Trojan hero who received from fame the welcome sound, and heard the champion's name, soon leaves the taken works and mounted walls. Greedy of war, where the greater glory calls, he springs to fight, exulting in his force. His jointed armor rattles in the course, like Eryx, or like Athos, great he shows or father Epinine, when, white with snows, his head divine obscure in clouds he hides, and shakes the sounding forest on his sides. The nations overawed secrete the fight, immovable their bodies fix their sight. Even death stands still, nor from above they throw their darts, nor drive their battering rams below. In silent order either army stands, and drop their swords unknowing from their hands. The Ausonian king beholds with wondering sight two mighty champions matched in single fight, born under climes remote and brought by fate with swords to try their titles to the state. Now in closed field each other from afar they view, and rushing on begin the war. They launch their spears, then hand to hand they meet, the trembling soil resounds beneath their feet. Their bucklers clash, their blows descend from high, and flakes of fire from their hard helmets fly. Courage conspires with chance, and both engage with equal fortunes yet in mutual rage. As when two bulls for their fair female fight in Silas' shades or on Tabernus's height, with horns adverse they meet, the keeper flies, 
Mute stands the herd, their heifers roll their eyes, And wait the event which victor they shall bear, And who shall be the lord to rule the lusty year? With rage of love the jealous rivals burn, And push for push, and wound for wound return. Their dewlap scored, their sides are laved in blood, Loud cries and roaring sounds rebellow through the wood. Such was the combat in the listed ground, So clashed their swords, and so their shields resound. Jove sets the beam. In either scale he lays the champion's fate, And each exactly weighs. On this side life and lucky chance ascends, Loaded with death that other scale descends. Raised on the stretch, young Turnus aims a blow, Full on the helm of his unguarded foe. Shrill shouts and clamors ring on either side, As hopes and fears their panting hearts divide. But all in pieces flies the traitor sword, And in the middle stroke deserts his lord. Now is but death or flight disarmed he flies, When in his hand an unknown hilt he spies. Fame says that Turnus, when his steeds he joined, Hurrying to war, disordered in his mind, Snatched the first weapon which his haste could find. "'Tis not the fated sword his father bore, "'but that his charioteer Mesticus wore. "'This, while the Trojans fled, the toughness held, "'but vain against the great Vulcanian shield. "'The mortal-tempered steel deceived his hand, "'the shivered fragments shone amid the sand. "'Surprised with fear, he fled along the field, "'and now forthright, and now in orbits wheeled, "'for here the Trojan troops the lists surround.' And there the pass is closed with pools and marshy ground. Aeneas hastens, though with heavier pace, His wound so newly knit retards the chase, And oft his trembling knees their aid refuse, Yet pressing foot by foot his foe pursues. Thus, when a fearful stag is closed around, With crimson toils or in a river found, High on the bank the deep-mouthed hound appears, still opening following still wherever he steers the persecuted creature to and fro turns here and there to scape his umbrian foe steep is the ascent and if he gains the land the purple death is pitched along the strand his eager foe determined to the chase stretched at his length gains ground at every pace now to his balmy head he makes his way and now he holds or thinks he holds his prey just at the pitch the stag springs out with fear. He bites the wind and fills his sounding jaws with air. The rocks, the lakes, the meadows ring with cries. The mortal tumult mounts and thunders in the skies. Thus flies the Danian prince and flying blames. His tardy troops, calling by their names, demands his trusty sword. The Trojan threats the realm with ruin, and their ancient seats to lay in ashes, if they dare supply with arms or aid his vanquished enemy. Thus menacing, he still pursues the course with vigor, though diminished of his force. Ten times already the listed place one chief had fled, and the other given chase. No trivial prize is played, for on the life or death of Turnus now depends the strife. Within the space an olive tree had stood, a sacred shade, a venerable wood, For vows to Faunus pay the Latin's guardian god. Here hung the vests, and tablets were engraved Of sinking mariners from shipwreck saved. With heedless hands the Trojans felled the tree, To make the ground enclosed for combat free. Deep in the root, whether by fate, or chance, Or erring haste, the Trojan drove his lance, then stooped and tugged with force immense to free the encumbered spear from the tenacious tree, that whom his fainting limbs pursued in vain, his flying weapon might from far attain. Confused with fear, bereft of human aid, then Turnus to the gods and first to Faunus prayed, O Faunus, pity, and thou, mother earth, where I, thy foster son, received my birth, hold fast the steel. If my religious hand your plant has honored, which your foes profaned, propitious hear my prayers, he said, nor with successless vows invoke their aid. The incumbent hero wrenched and pulled and strained, but still the stubborn earth the steel detained. 
Juturna took her time, and while in vain he strove, assumed Meticus' form again, and in that imitated shape restored the despairing prince his Danian sword. The queen of love, who with disdain and grief saw the bold nymph afford this prompt relief, to assert her offspring with a greater deed, from the tough root of the lingering weapon freed. Once more erect the rival chiefs advance, one trusts the sword, the other the pointed lance, and both resolved alike to try their fatal chance. Meantime, imperial Jove to Juno speak, who from a shining cloud beheld the shock, what new arrest, O Queen of Heaven, is sent To stop the fates now laboring in the event? What farther hopes are left thee to pursue? Divine Aeneas, and thou knows it too, Foredoomed to these celestial seats are due. What more attempts for Turnus can be made That this thou lingerest in this lonely shade? Is it becoming of the due respect And awful honor of a god elect, A wound unworthy of our state to feel, patient of human hands and earthly steel, or seems it just the sister should restore a second sword when one was lost before, and arm a conquered wretch against his conqueror. For what, without thy knowledge and avow, nay more, thy dictate durst Juturna do? At last, in deference to my love, forbear to lodge within thy soul this anxious care. Reclined upon my breast, thy grief unload, who should relieve the goddess but the god? Now all things to their utmost issue tend, Pushed by the fates to their appointed, While leave was given thee, and a lawful hour For vengeance, wrath, and unresisted power. Tossed on the seas, thou could thy foes distress, And driven ashore with hostile arms oppress, Deform the royal house, And from the side of the just bridegroom Tear the plighted bride. Now cease at my command, the thunderer said, and with dejected eyes this answer Juno made. Because your dread decree too well I knew, from Turnus and from earth unwilling I withdrew, else should you not behold me here alone, involved in empty clouds, my friends bemoan, but girt with vengeful flames in open sight, engaged against my foes in mortal fight. Tis true, Juturna mingled in the strife, by my command, to save her brother's life, at least to try, but by the Stygian lake, the most religious oath the gods can take, with this restriction not to bend the bow, or toss the spear, or trembling dart to throw, and now resigned to your superior might, and tired with fruitless toils, I loathe the fight. This let me beg, and this no fates withstand, both for myself and for your father's land that when the nuptial bed shall bind the peace, which I, since you ordain, consent to bless, the laws of either nation be the same, but let the Latins still retain their name. Speak the same language which they spoke before, wear the same habits which their grandsires wore, call them not Trojans, perish the renown and name of Troy, with that detested town, Latium be Latium still, let Alba reign, and Rome's immortal majesty remain. Then thus the founder of mankind replies, Unruffled was his front, serene his eyes. Can Saturn's issue and heaven's other air Such endless anger in her bosom bear? Be mistress, and your full desires obtain, But quench the collar you foment in vain. From ancient blood the Ausonian people sprung, Shall keep their name, their habit, and their tongue. The Trojans to their customs shall be tied. I will myself their common rights provide. The natives shall command, the foreigners subside. All shall be Latium, Troy without a name. And her lost sons forget from whence they came. From blood so mixed a pious race shall flow, Equal to gods excelling all below. No nation more respect to you shall pay, Or greater offerings on your altars lay. Juno consents. Well pleased that her desires had found success, and from the cloud retires. The peace thus made, the thunderer next prepares to force the watery goddess from the wars. Deep in the dismal regions void of light, three daughters at a birth were born to night. These their brown 
mother brooding on her care, endued with windy wings to flit in air, with serpents girt alike and crowned with hissing hair. In heaven the dire called, and still at hand, before the throne of angry Jove they stand, his ministers of wrath, and ready still, the minds of mortal men with fears to fill. Whenever the moody sire, to wreak his hate on realms or towns deserving of their fate, hurls down diseases, death, and deadly care, and terrifies the guilty world with war. One sister plague, if these from heaven he sent, to fright Juturna with a dire portent. The pest comes whirling down, by far more slow springs the swift arrow from the Parthen bow, or side on you, when traversing the skies, and drenched in poisonous juice the sure destruction flies, with such a sudden and unseen a flight, shot through the clouds the daughter of the night soon as the field enclosed she had in view and from afar her destined quarry knew contracted to the boding bird she turns which haunts the ruined piles and hallowed urns and beats about the tombs with nightly wings where songs obscene on sepulchres she sings thus lessened in her form with frightful cries the fury round unhappy turnus flies flaps on his shield and flutters o'er his eyes a lazy chillness crept along his blood choked was his voice his hair with horror stood juturna from afar beheld her fly and knew the ill omen by her screaming cry and strider of her wings amazed with fear her beauteous breast she beat and rent her flowing th hair ah me she cries in this unequal strife what can thy sister more to save thy life weak as i am can i alas contend in arms with that inexorable fiend now now i quit the field forbear to fright my tender soul ye baleful birds of night the lashing of your wings i know too well the sounding flight and funeral screams of hell these are the gifts you bring from haughty jove the worthy recompense of my ravished love. Did he for this exempt my life from fate? O oh, hard conditions of immortal state! Though born to death, not privileged to die, but forced to bear imposed eternity, take back your envious bribes and let me go, companion to my brother's ghost below. The joys are vanished. Nothing now remains of life immortal but immortal pains. What earth will open her devouring womb To rest a weary goddess in the tomb? She drew a length of sighs. Nor more, she said, but in her azure mantle wrapped her head, Then plunged into her stream with a deep despair, And her last sobs came bubbling up in air. Now stern Aeneas his weighty spear against his foe, And thus abrades his fear. What farther subterfuge can Turnus find? What empty hopes are harbored in his mind? Tis not thy swiftness can secure thy flight, Nor with their feet but hands the valiant fight. Vary thy shape in thousand forms, And dare what skill and courage can attempt in war. Wish for the wings of winds to mount the sky, Or hid within the hollow earth to lie. The champion shook his head, and made this short reply. No threats of thine, my manly mind, can move, Tis hostile heaven I dread, and partial Jove. He said no more, but with a sigh repressed The mighty sorrow in his swelling breast. Then as he rolled his troubled eyes around, An antique stone he saw the common bound Of neighboring fields, and barrier of the ground, So vast that twelve strong men of modern days The enormous weight from earth could hardly raise. He heaved it at a lift, and poised on high, ran staggering on his enemy, but so disordered that he scarcely knew his way or what unwieldy weight he threw. His knocking knees are bent beneath the load, and shivering cold congeals his vital blood. The stone drops from his arms, and falling short for want of vigor mocks his vain effort. And as when a heavy sleep has closed the sight, the sickly fancy labors in the night, 
we seem to run and destitute of force our sinking limbs forsake us in the course in vain we heave for breath in vain we cry the nerves embrace their usual strength deny and on the tongue the faltering accents die so turnus fared whatever means he tried all force of arms and points of art employed the fury flew athwart and made the endeavor void a thousand various thoughts his soul confound he started about nor aid nor issue found his own men stop the pass and his own walls surround once more he pauses and looks out again and seeks the goddess charioteer in vain trembling he views the thundering chief advance and brandishing aloft the deadly lance amazed he cowers beneath the conquering foe forgets to ward and waits the coming blow astonished while he stands and fixed with fear aimed at his shield he sees the impending spear the hero measured first with narrow view the destined mark and rising as he threw with its full swing the fatal weapon flew not with less rage the rattling thunder falls or stones from battering engines break the walls swift as a whirlwind from an arm so strong the lance drove on and bore the death along not could his sevenfold shield the prince avail nor aught beneath his arms the coat of mail it pierced through all and with a grisly wound transfixed his thigh and doubled him to ground with groans the latins rend the vaulted sky woods hills and valleys to the voice reply now low on earth the lofty chief is laid and with eyes cast upward and with arms displayed and recreant thus to the proud victor prayed i know my death deserved nor hope to live use what the gods and thy good fortune give yet think o oh think if mercy may be shown thou hadst a father once and hast a son pity my sire now sinking to the grave and for anchises sake old donis save or if thy vowed revenge pursue my death give to my friends my body void of breath the latian chiefs have seen me beg my life thine is the conquest thine the royal wife against the yielded man tis mean ignoble strife in deep suspense the trojan seemed to stand and just prepared to strike repressed his hand he rolled his eyes and every moment felt his manly soul with more compassion melt when casting down a casual glance he spied the golden belt that glittered on his side the fatal spoils which haughty turnus tore from dying palace and in triumph war then roused anew to wrath he loudly cries flames while he spoke came flashing from his eyes traitor dost thou dost thou to grace pretend clad as thou art in trophies of my friend to his sad soul a grateful offering go tis pallas pallas gives this deadly blow he raised his arm aloft and at the word deep in his bosom drove the shining sword the streaming blood disdained his arms around and the disdainful soul came rushing through the wound end of book 12 end of the aeneid by virgil translated by john dryden recording by david lipa san francisco california